Welcome everyone to Transforming the World Supply of Neo-Rare Earth Magnets, presented by Urban Mining and TSD. My name is Stacy Roy, and I'm with Modus Labs, who is the sponsor of this webinar. TSD is an authorized partner of Modus Labs. Modus Labs provides a new line of innovative geared solutions for robotics and motion control. Present today with TSD is Texas-based Urban Mining, who is a new alternative source for higher power ND, FE, B magnets with reduced environmental impact and supply chain risk. Before we begin, if you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A section, not the chat area. We will address questions at the end. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dave Hicks and Peter Afuni. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, this is Dave Hicks. Hi, everyone. First off, I'd like to thank Modus Labs for inviting Peter and I to participate in this webinar. And thank you, Stacy, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Dave Hicks. I'm with TSD. I'm a manufacturer's rep. I've been in technical sales for 35 years with uh, starting out in motors and then moved on to magnets. And I worked for Crucible Magnetics for a few years and represented vacuum smelts in Germany. I'm very excited to uh, be part of the urban mining team, similar to what uh, Modus Labs is doing with uh, gears and gear solutions. Uh, urban mining has a, what I consider a transformational magnet technology uh, in manufacturing that is uh, being done in the United States. Peter. Thank you, Dave. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Afuni. I am currently the executive vice president of Urban Mining Company. I've been a part of this project since really its inception. Um, I've been in the materials industry for 15 years and more specifically in the neo-magnetic materials industry for about 10 years. I, alongside a, a really spectacular team of, of professionals and technical professionals, um, have really been a key part of reshoring Neo production in the United States. As Stacy mentioned um, in her introduction, our vision was to transform the world's Neo supply chain with a practical path towards resource efficiency and independence. And we achieved this through commercializing our magnet to magnet recycling technology, which ultimately produces products at a commercial scale that exhibit higher performance and uh, compared to traditionally produced magnets, excuse me. Um, we put ourselves in a position to utilize a decentralized supply chain for NDFEB production to serve the broader magnet market. And we're, and we're doing so by delivering performance-based products and the capability to mitigate supply chain and price risk, threatening the development of high-tech, high-efficiency solutions. So this is a very important consideration in today's geopolitical climate. It is, it, it is especially important in society and the broader market as we continue to usher in the age of electrification where the electric motor will play an even more significant role. So, so it's needless to say the future is electric. Our, our intentions today are to present one of the key drivers in growing demand, electromobility applications, in order to provide some context to this quote unquote age of electrification and talk about how the neo-magnet industry in the United States has been revitalized with domestic production to support a growing domestic and global supply chain uh, for neo-magnets. So let's start with e-mobility. Uh, to briefly recap, and for those of you who don't know, I'm sure everybody here is pretty aware, well aware of what e-mobility is, but electromobility is really the umbrella term for terms in the current development of electric drives and powertrains. It represents the concept of using electric powertrain technology, communication technology, and connected infrastructures to enable electric propulsion, really. Um, despite the diversity and the complexity of all of those interlocking components, our focus on today's talk will be the trends in electromobility through the permanent magnet motor, um, and more specifically, the use of permanent magnets in, in drive train and in-hub motor technology. 
So <clears throat> let's look at trends um, in electric mo mobility across four overarching groups, um, automotive mobility, urban air mobility, marine mobility, and micro mobility. So the automotive industry is really a key driver in demand and growth um, in electro mobility. And it's really creating, um, especially over the next five to 10 years, some of the biggest challenges, supply chain challenges that we'll see for neo magnets just generally. Um, electric vehicle sales are expected to rise in the coming decade where we're gonna see a transition from internal combustion engines to battery electric vehicle drivetrains. Um, a major contributor to this trend is emission regulations and decarbonization targets. Some examples in Europe um, include European countries that have already set specific dates for removing diesel and gas-driven gas vehicles from roads. There are already Nor Nordic countries will stop registering vehicles with internal combustion engines by 2025. And so by roughly 2040, the rest of the EU follow, at least will follow, at least that's what the predictions are, are, are saying. Um, we even see examples here in the United States, I'm sure you guys are well aware of. General Motors is introducing 30 new electric vehicles for global distribution by 2025. And states like California are phasing out gasoline powered cars, or at least they aim to phase out gasoline powered cars by 2030. Regardless of that timeline though, these reg and, and these regulations, we still expect to see more than a third of vehicles to be equipped with some type of battery electric vehicle technology globally. That's huge. Um, another trend is urban air mobility. So, so this market is driven by uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing technology. Some reports estimate over $1.5 trillion potential market in just EV toll. Um, this year, the Federal Aviation Administration approved commercial automated drone flights in US airspace. So this is a big um, move that's gonna set some precedents going to the future. Um, I think the drones are limited to about 400 feet in altitude and only rural areas. Um, but that actually has an impact on quite a few industries, including agriculture, utility industry, mining industry, transportation industry. So it's, it's, it's a pretty huge move by the FFA, excuse me, FAA. And it's, and it's going to set precedents for the expansion of these potential regulations to include a broader market for vertical takeoff and landing taxi and package delivery services. Um, so that, that's another big market that's driving neo, neo demand. And then there are of course examples of this in marine mobility with all electric container ships. We've seen in um, the defense industry, the um, transition of, uh, into electric propulsion in submarine groups uh, as another example. Uh, and then of course, like the impact of micromobility in urban environments. I'm sure you guys all have seen Lime and Bird scooters running around cities and all of those use an electric drivetrain that uses neo magnets. Um, so anyway, I think, I think everyone gets it. These are the trends that are driving growth and the automotive markets are absolutely leading the way and driving you know, supply and, and demand conditions. Um, and you know, we're gonna see similar trends in motion control, robotics, uh, automation, uh, aerospace defense, the energy sectors. And the important consideration in all these trends uh, is that at the center of, center of it all is the magnet. Magnets, neo-magnets are at the heart of electrification and it is the material choice for electric motors. It serves as a critical junction for electrical, where electrical energy is converted into mechanical force and vice versa. The Neo magnet is used to exploit this effect and optimize size, efficiency, speed, precision. And there are flat out no rivals. There's nothing that's gonna be coming online from an R&D perspective. There are no combination of elements on the periodic table that can yield the permanent magnet properties that you get from a neo magnet. And they essentially create products that do not suffer from mechanical resonance or high iron losses. There are no excitation losses there, um, you know, which translates to a substantial increase in efficiency, um, which parallels a lot of the policy initiatives that are part of uh, our, our domestics or our federal government uh, plans. Um, they produce high torque and high power output per volume 
compared to any other material and have better dynamic performance due to the flux density in the air gap. And there's a ton of other probably features that, that you guys know about more than I do, but th there's a ton of advantages to using this magnet. So uh, we believe that the future is electric and that magnets play a critical role in a high tech, low carbon future. Thanks, Peter. So if magnets are so critical, what happened to our uh, neodymium production here in the United States? It's generally accepted that uh, neomagnet discovery was, uh, was born out of the US uh, Navy research labs in 1983. Uh, they, along with uh, General Motors and Sumitomo uh, collaborated and those companies took the discovery and focused on optimizing and commercializing the neodymium magnet technology. General Motors spun off uh, a company called MagnaQuench who focused predominantly on the production of melt spun ribbons, compounds, and magnet uh, products and materials. Sumitomo later acquired, was later acquired by Itachi and they focused on the development of uh, the processes and products for the manufacture of sintered magnet products. Uh, then came along cross-licensing of the technology, um, which occurred and uh, due to license and further pat patent development occurred in China, Japan, and in Europe. Companies like Hitachi, Vacuum Smeltza, Shinitsu, and uh, Crucible Magnetics, which was part of Colt. By the 1990s, um, there were four major neodymium uh, magnet mills producing in the United States, Crucible, Hitachi, MagnaQuench, and UGMag, all of which ceased to exist in the United States by, by uh, 20, uh, 2005. Over the course of uh, 20 years, the entire industry, which started in the United States, was dismantled and exported to entities who establish operations outside of the US. Outside of the fascinating history with uh, crucible magnetics and uh, allegedly organized crime groups, I don't believe there was a mass, massive uh, conspiracy as to why you know, this actually happened, but I do believe that it was generally accepted as a seemingly logical course of action, no matter how sh short-sighted we think it was looking back at that time. Needless to say, pretty much by 2005, the neodymium magnet manufacturing industry was totally out of the United States, ex just completely exported. The only companies that remained in the United States at that time were producing magnetic materials and products. And we've excluded, uh, excluding the uh, distributors and fabricators. The only ones left were Arnold Magnetics, Thomas and & Skinner, and Electron Energy Corporation, none of which produced centered neodymium iron boron magnetic materials in the United States as a, as a mill. It wasn't until 2016 when Urban Mining Company brought neodymium iron boron production back to the United States with the introduction of magnet to magnet and grain boundary engineering technology. Urban Mining Company is currently operational in Texas, producing neodymium iron boron magnetic materials, products, and related assemblies. This resurgent was disruptive because there was for the first time ever an established production capacity in the United States that had a decentralized rare earth supply chain with the development of magnet to magnet technology. Over the last three years, capacity for centered neo production in the United States went from zero tons per year to 2,000 tons per year with one single facility. Plans to develop production at greater than 10,000 tons per year are in place. Uh, the land and construction infra infrastructure is all, also there to back it up. This has several implications to the market and the supply chain because it not only supports um, the downstream development of the electric motor supply chain, within North America, but it also props up um, the capability that, that can incentivize further upstream development of the rare earth 
uh, supply chain in the United States. However, upstream processes take time to develop and with the introduction of our recycling technology to the market, we became the only magnet mill globally with the capacity to produce um, upcycled magnets without using hydrometallurgical processes to separate into individual oxides for metal production. And, and we are the only neo-magnet producer in the Western Hemisphere. We have achieved a 48% uh, re uh, energy reduction compared to the traditional magnet producer and are 91% more energy efficient than their traditional mine to magnet production chain. Based on a life cycle impact assessment we conducted with Purdue University, our process has roughly 40% of the impact across the life cycle inventory when compared to the traditional supply chain. So let's, let's touch on supply chain. I, I think those are good, good breakdown of the history and, and I think it all tie together as we kind of get through this presentation. Um, <clears throat> so as, as, as all of you or many of you may know, um, neo-magnets are a sort of national security and critical material sort of uh, class designation by the Department of Defense and, and have perceived, been perceived and really are um, a, a risk when it comes to uh, supply chains generally. So we're starting to see um, corporate supply chain shifts to address these national security concerns and the risks associated with neo-magnet um, availability. Um, more generally and like outside of the the microcosm of, of NDFEB, there's, there have also been trends in like a globalization pause and reversal since 2008. Um, and that has also played a major role in supply chain shifts. And, you know, if we dive a little bit deeper um, on what this actually looks like, we can, we can point to a few examples. So, uh, First and foremost, like automation within the domestic industry is softening any sort of like labor cost differential between developing nations and, and, uh, and um, the United States. So that, that's becoming less and less of an argument, especially um, with high tech industries uh, like magnet manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> growing sort of national security concerns with China as, as a rival, uh, that's a big one. I mean, we saw, uh, I think it was in 2019, where, where 2533C, um, which was part of the National Defense Authorization Act, a subsection of the National Defense Authorization Act that was codified into law, essentially prohibiting the use of NDFEB uh, materials in any sort of defense and use application. Um, so that, that obviously is accelerating supply chain shifts for aerospace and defense industries or, or, or tiered suppliers that support the aerospace and defense industries. Um, there, have all, there have also been protectionist measures, things like tariffs, the Section 301 tariffs had an impact. So a lot, a lot of these things compounded along with market manipulation with rare earth materials and price have been sort of a, an accumulation of hits that, that, have, that have impacted what is our customer base or really the motor manufacturers or anybody that's, that's buying neo-magnets to try to figure out ways to, to shift their supply chains. How do we mitigate um, from, from the risks associated with Chinese rare earth materials um, being, being dominated by Chinese production and ultimately policy. Um, so as a result, you know, supply, the supply chain shifts that are occurring um, are finding tremendous value in what we're offering as a domestic producer of NEO, um, who, who is a magnet producer, but also one that can combat the geopolitical risk and mitigate the price volatility through a magnet to magnet recycling technology. So let's tie all this together into the technology. Um, you know, magnets are not uh, uh, off the shelf commodities. They are very much engineered products. And, 
And due to the innovation in material science and increased performance at higher temperatures, NDFEB has become widely adopted um, and more rapidly adopted in applications beyond its initial use back in the early 80s, which is con consumer electronics. Um, so, so drivetrain and in-hub motor applications and electric mobility is a, is a perfect example of this, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you can sit back and ask yourself, why now? Like, why, why is there a, a, a trend towards electrification? Why is there a, a strong demand push in electromobility, for example? And it's tied to the material science, right? Um, because as we fine tuned the composition over time, um, its, its use in a wider array of applications became more available. So <clears throat> the reestablishment of a NDFEB magnet production facility in the United States is more important than ever, especially as we see growth in the market, uh, which is demanding more finely engineered magnets uh, with the requirement to perform in very harsh environments and conditions. Um, so you know, one way to illustrate everything that I'm saying is by looking at the coerc coercivity of magnets against market size. So <clears throat> very generally, global demand for NDFEB is greater than 170,000, about 175,000 tons now annually. And, and this represents about $20 billion annually. And so US accounts for approximately 20% of global demand. And there is a expectation that we're gonna have a massive capacity problem within the next five to 10 years, uh, because that demand will double uh, easily within the next seven to 10 years. Um, there are even some reports out by the Wall Street Journal expecting it to be over 400,000 tons in, in, in terms of demand. And the US included, China included, Europe included, there just isn't enough capacity there. Um, and you know, the, the, the hope and the expectation is that you're gonna see more capacity installation and that you know, we're just one small piece of the puzzle. So um, now let's look at this chart uh, to, to illustrate this, this trend. So uh, magnet market size, uh, so this, this chart is looking at NDFEB magnet market size or applications by coercivity requirement in kiloamps per meter. So the coercivity requirement is, is typically an indicator of like a more finely tuned composition of a magnet that is designed to work in a more harsh environment or a higher temperature environment. Okay, and on the left column, we have market size and millions of dollars. And on the bottom, we have a time scale looking at relative market size every 10 years. And so then each shade of gray represents sort of this fine tuning of magnet composition that gives you a coercivity that is greater than a certain level. And then you can see that, you know, every 10 years, you see this massive shift in the demand for the higher temperature or the higher coercivity type materials. And that's what's driving the growth. That's what's driving the demand. And it's driven ultimately by automotive, the automotive industry, or really, you know, the motor industry um, that is going to be pushing those numbers to the, to the next level. So, you know, how does this how does this actually break down in terms of like technology development? Like, where does urban mining companies sit in like the progression of technology development? So, the material adoption in electric motor applications corresponds exactly with this this technology development and the strategies employed to improve magnetic properties over time, right? And so, this table is showing like the different strategies and mechanisms that were employed to go to the next sort of like era of magnet production, right? When, when, when magnets were first invented in 1983, you know, you had a energy product between 20 megagauss Orsteds and 38 megagauss Orsteds as being like the total available commercial range. And then, you know, introducing new compositions changed the amorphous phase during annealing. And that gave you you know, a greater than 40 megagauss Orsted uh, product without sacrificing remnants. And, and so then the focus became, okay, how do we reduce defects in order to like make that uh, microstructure as uniform as possible during the annealing stage? Well, that hit a plateau at some point. And then um, 
then the next evolution was, okay, how do we fine tune the grain boundary? Because then the discovery was in the literature that a thin continuous grain boundary that surrounds all of the grains of the magnet material um, would, would support sort of the, the effect of the negative effect ex exchange decoupling could have on remnants when you're annealing the product. And so then that became a part of the art or the, a term of art in, in that time. And then in 2007 and 2008, um, you had grain boundary diffusion, which was an invention that was introduced by um, Sagawa. And actually our chief technology officer had a hand in developing um, the grain boundary diffusion technology back in 2007 and 2008 uh, with, with some of the, the, the industry folks out in, out in Asia. Um, and so then that became a process and that's a, that's a post-processing technique, right? So they took what had been done to date and said, okay, let's now introduce a new process. Instead of introducing binary alloys of heavy rare earths into the production process, we'll introduce it in, into a post-production environment and deposit it on the surface and that can optimize sort of material usage. And then, and then that pushed the boundaries to, of, 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 or the capabilities to a whole nother, to a whole nother level. And then, in 2016, when Urban Mining, Company, Urban Mining Company came into the market, we introduced grain boundary engineering and grain boundary modification, um, which is creating a multi-component grain boundary. It's not a post-processing technique. It's not using binary alloys um, and, and ultimately represents the state of the art. And so when we look at the state of the art for magnet production globally, you know, magnet to magnet recycling in conjunction with grain boundary engineering technology or grain boundary engineering technology used as just a standalone method to produce magnets um, defined urban mining company as an organization that can produce products that exhi exhibit the highest thermal stability with the least amount of heavy rare earths Within a, within a process that was like in situ. So it happened within a process. It wasn't a post-processing technique. And, and that was fully integrated into production that added additional efficiencies in terms of energy reduction and material costs. So let's look at this chart to like illustrate this like with data, right? And so, if, you know, going from, going from left to right, you know, we're looking at, four different commercial grades of magnets. Uh, that's uh, N42SH, all with this, excuse me, four different commercially provided magnets, all with the same grades, okay? All N42SH type grade material as, de as, as defined by those particular suppliers. Um, and then we compared that, we, we, we did an analysis across a bunch of features. So microstructure features, looking at grain size and, and grain boundary phase uh, ratios. And then we looked at, at, at composition. Um, and so essentially what we were able to identify first is that, okay, grain size was, there was a range of grain size that was, that was available or that was, that was produced by all, all these varying suppliers, urban mining included. And there was a ratio of grain boundary phase that everyone had, right? Um, what was, what's unique about our grain boundary phase is that it's multi-component, right? We're not using binaries. Everyone else is using binaries. We're using a more finely tuned composition because we have a deeper understanding of, of the behaviors of certain elements, transition elements combined with rare earth elements that enhance properties efficiently. Um, and, then, and then that yielded an activation energy that was among among the higher activation energy. So the more, the higher activation energy you have, the more stable your magnet is at higher temperature, which means you have uh, a better chance for recovering what are called reversible losses. And then, so then if you plot that from a compositional standpoint and you then compare those features against composition, you have a magnet that's produced by our, by our technology that is, that, that contains the, the least amount of heavy rare earth materials with the highest activation energy, or in other words, highest thermal stability than any other magnet that's commercially produced. So this, was, this, this is obviously a breakthrough 
Uh, and to use Dave's word, like it is truly transformative and very disruptive in what we're able to do with grain boundary engineering, because that's what's giving us the capability to have control over composition when we're using end of life material as a feedstock to produce magnets. And it's also how we're able to compete um, with traditional producers, uh, even if we did not use end of life material as a feedstock to produce magnets. So, um, you know, as we think about integrating magnets into motor technology or powertrain technology, which is fueling a lot of these trends for growth, uh, it's important that, you know, especially this part of the presentation that we approach the process of magnetic material de development from an engineering perspective so that we optimize performance for the magnet uh, for, for the particular application by finally tuning the composition. And, and that's why we're saying magnets are engineered products and not commodities. And, and if there's anything that can demonstrate that, it's, it's the fact that you can buy four different, four different magnets from four different suppliers and have four very, very different types of products. Um, so to conclude. Great, uh, thanks, Peter. So a few conclusions that we draw here. Uh, first of all, just to reiterate, the future is electric. Neodymium magnets are the heart of electrification. Uh, Urban Mining Company has brought neodymium, iron, uh, neodymium magnet production back to the United States. Uh, magnet recycling mitigates supply chain and stabilize uh, supply chain risk and stabilizes prices. Grain boundary engineering is the state of the art for magnet production. And magnets are engineered products, not commodities supplied off the shelf. Yeah, so yeah, thanks, uh, Dave. That, that really summarizes it there. Um, I guess, Stacy, uh, we'll throw it back to you. And you know, we're ready to answer any questions and open this up for discussion since Dave and I just spoke for 35 minutes. Great. All right, everyone, the Q&A is now open. All right, we're getting our first question now. All right, our first question is, is urban mining a producer of magnets or a recycler of magnets? Dave, you want me to take this one? Yeah, go ahead, Peter. Um, so we're both. Uh, so we, 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 are, we are a manufacturer of NDFEB magnetic materials, uh, products and assemblies. Um, and we, we make finished products that's designed to a specification provided by our customers. And we can produce those materials either with an end of life feedstock and deal with a recycling process that, that mitigates that supply chain risk and, and stabilizes the price. Um, or, we can, or we can use a, a virgin feedstock, right? So, but, but the final product is neodymium iron boron magnetic materials, um, which can also be integrated into assemblies. All right, we got a second question. What operations are performed in the Texas plant? Um, so the plant, and uh, Dave mentioned this, you know, it's, it's a facility that's designed for 2,000 tons of sintered neo output. And, and, and we have full-blown capability to do demagnetization, magnet harvesting, coarse powder milling, fine powder milling, pressing, aligning, sintering, annealing, um, machining the magnets to a spec, uh, coating and plating. Um, we have an assembly, uh, uh, an, air, an assembly area. We can do magnetizing, um, um, obviously packaging that kind of goes hand in hand with, with delivering products. We have a full, like one of the, one of the best, arguably, uh, metallographic and materials laboratories in the country. Um, that's that's really not only used as an R and D arm of you know for our R and D arm of our business, um, but is a critical part in quality control of our products. Um, and so we have a whole suite of like metallographic and magnetic analytic magnet and analytical tools, 
Uh, we can do compositional analysis. We can do stress tests. We can do corrosion tests. Um, environment, you know, um, create really, really any sort of condition that that needs to be needs to be tested. So, and a lot of a lot of what we do in that in that lab really is to mirror a lot of our customers' requirements. Uh, we have a, a a tool room that builds out molds and 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 um, fixtures for for assemblies. Um, you know that that can either be owned by Urban Mining Company or owned by our customers, and we can manage that inventory. Um, and we also have a bonded store area, which is essentially a a um, sort of lock and key guarded uh, area of our facility where we keep materials or safety stock of inventory or or um, you know high value components that are that are part of you know our downstream supply chain or our customer supply chain. Um, so there's quite a bit that and a, quite a bit of capability. Um, we are operational now. We are producing prototypes. We are delivering. We are delivering parts to customers um, to to get qualifications started and 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 done. Um, so yeah, there's there's quite a bit there, but there's also very much an engineering ramp that's happening and a scale up effort that's happening in order to keep up with the demand. And so um, that engineering effort is is ongoing, and our facility is only sized for two thousand tons, and we're already thinking about factory number two and factory number three because just the demand is off the charts. Yeah, and that picture is perfect as it looks. That's our facility. It's uh, in San Marcos, Texas, which is just, uh, what, about 30 minutes south of, of Austin. And uh, yeah, we welcome visits with our customers. It's a uh, state-of-the-art facility. Absolutely, absolutely beautiful. We've got another question, and it's, did lax slash more favorable environmental regulations in China influence the man magnet manufacturers vacating the U.S. and other countries? And then the second part of the question is, how have U.S. EPA regulations been a challenge for the Texas plant? Um, yeah, so the history is an interesting one. I don't, I don't think, you know, I think that it was just like exit strategies. It, I, you know, I, I think that it was, it was Japanese companies looking to consolidate an industry, um, American companies looking to divest certain arms uh, of their businesses and then taking advantage of sort of like, uh, of, of more of like an economic case. I mean, this is all speculative. I don't, I don't really know what it was at that point in time. Um, environmental regulations could have, could have played a role into it. I would, I would hope that that wasn't really the case and that was more of an economic argument just because you know these are the companies that consolidated you know like crucible magnetics was ultimately consolidated by by vacuum schmelzer right and then they you know um you know uh it's it's now what the, is the sand vac facility in 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 uh in china uh so like i i would imagine that those types of companies have good a good handle on environmental components of it so I wouldn't say that it was exactly that. I think it was more of an economic argument um, and, 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 and a short-sighted one uh, for that. But uh, that's, that's just an opinion. I don't know if, uh, Dave, you want to add to that, but that's, that's kind of what I think about that. Yeah, it, it just seems, looking back over the decades, it, it just seems like it was another, uh, unfortunately, it was just another industry that got, got caught up in the, China, in the China thing. You know, it seems like, you know, everybody was, you know, let's just do, you know, lower cost or cheaper, or maybe there were some environmental things associated with it, but uh, just a mass mass exodus of a, of a lot of industries uh, that, that went to China. And it, it just seems like that that's starting to have a, re, a reverse, a reversal right now. Yeah, which I think is really good for domestic economy. But um, to answer the other question, US EPA regulations, have they been a challenge for the Texas plant? Uh, no, I mean, you get, you got a checklist that you have to follow. Um, I think coding and plating um, becomes more of an issue um, because there, you know, there's some waste that you have to treat there. But you know, our plant was purpose built, and we had the luxury of building on a greenfield site, and so 
we were able to we were able to uh, 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 you know, take advantage of the fact that we were able to build from the ground up and install closed loop systems and you know make sure that we're not discharging any water and and you know have like the systems in place to like optimize our production which is ultimately going to reduce costs over time so yeah i wouldn't say it's much of an issue or hasn't really been that big of a challenge i think the biggest area where we we're going to see challenges um are are you know in the plating processes but we're not going to introduce nickel plating or you know we don't have plans to introduce nickel plating um because it's carcinogenic and you know, doesn't necessarily have better properties than zinc plating, for, for example. Um, so uh, at least in the short term, and even if we did, it's, it's a pretty simple checklist to follow. And, and, you know, we've got the right people behind it. All right. A new question from John. What kind of premium do you charge for your U.S. magnets? So that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, so like our value prop, so of course we want to price magnets to market, right? Um, but our value is not necessarily the price. We're not trying to be a low cost Chinese producer um, or, or even compete with the low cost Chinese producer, even though we potentially can uh, to scoop up market share. Um, our goal and what we're offering to our customers is stable price. So you know, just in the last seven months, we saw an uh, increase in Neo and Prezio prices by I think like 80 to 100 percent. There might have been there might have been a correction. Um, I don't see it going to, back down to where it was to a year ago. I, I think the trend is going to continue to go up with the with demand the way that it is. And so our value prop is we'll stabilize a price for you because we have a recycling technology. So we'll price to market. You might even be a little bit more expensive by 10, 15%. But what you get in exchange for that is a stable price in the long run that allows you to predict cost over time. And so if there's going to be a 50% fluctuation in rare earth prices, that's going to cause a supply chain issue or a costing issue, we'll be able to insulate from those fluctuations in the market um, because we have a magnet recycling technology. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what our strategy is. Um, our goal is to find partners who don't look at price as the only factor, right? There's a lot of other variables that go into picking a supply chain partner, safety stock, lead times, quality, delivery. Trans transport, transport. Transportation costs, that's, that's transportation really big costs. right now. Yeah, and then, and then if you think about all the ESG initi initiatives, you know, we hit on every single ESG component, right? I mean, carbon footprint, getting close to, you know, reducing carbon footprint, getting close to carbon neutral. Um, and all of that kind of exists within a very, very competitive realm. I mean, compared to the Japanese producers, I'd say we're a smoking deal. <laughs> I don't know if Dave, you'd agree, but that's-, Ab that's Absolutely. That's All right. Um, there are no more questions in the Q&A box. And so I'd like to mention that we'll be sending out this recording later today as a link. And of course, you are all welcome to contact TSD if you have any other questions later on. Any other comments, Dave or Peter? All good. All good on my end. So this concludes today's webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for attending and have a great week. Thank you. Thanks, guys.